Welcome to Philosopher's Lunch, uh, an event organized by Studium Generale Delft and Brandstof, um, with the idea of making you think about your daily life and making you questions, question the beliefs you have about what you do. Um, we're very happy we have Hanno Sauer here today, a German philosopher who works at Tilburg University at the moment, and he's going to speak about intentionality. So please welcome Hanno Sauer. Yes, thanks uh, for the introduction. Thank you all for coming, for your interest in philosophy and our free sandwiches. Uh, and thanks to the Brandstoff people and uh, Delft University for inviting me and for organizing this event. Uh, it's really nice and I'm uh, glad to be here. And uh, I would like to speak about uh, the so-called Nob effect or side effect effect and uh, the philosophical implications it might have. But before I start with this, I would um, like to run a little um, experiment. So I would like you to take uh, the handout that you have, or that I, I hope most of you have one, um, and take 60 seconds or something in that ballpark um, and read the first vignette that you find uh, on this handout. So take 60 seconds, seconds to do that, uh, and then um, we, we'll see what follows from those kinds of stories. All right, so I reckon most of you will be done by now. Uh, the basic outlines of this story are pretty simple. Uh, you know, there is the vice president of the company, walks up to the chairman, uh, says, you know, we're thinking about implementing this new program. Should we do it? And it has this side effect on the environment. And the chairman says, I don't care at all about the environment. Let's implement the program. And so he, you know, knows about the side effect and he sort of happily you know, accepts that it will, uh, will, will be brought about by implementing the program. Um, and then the question, so you give this this type of vignette uh, to people, in this case, where the original experiment was done uh, in, uh, in a park in Manhattan by Joshua Nob in 2003. So you give this type of vi vignette uh, to people, and then you ask them, did the chairman bring about the side effect on the environment intentionally? And I would like to, what would, like you to, uh, what would like to ask you this question as well. So do you think that the side effect that was brought about by implementing this new program um, was brought about intentionally by uh, the chairman of the company. So who thinks it was brought about intentionally? Please raise your hand. All right, exactly. So this worked out perfectly. Uh, and thanks to Jonathan Weber for suggesting this method to me. So you see there is, uh, there is, there is a split that uh, aligns exactly with the aisle in the audience. And the reason for that is that you receive two different versions of this story. Uh, and the two different versions, they only differ in one very, very subtle, tiny respect. Namely, one vignette contains the word harm the environment, and the other vignette contains the word help the environment. And it turns out, and this is a very, very robust effect, you find it in all cultures, you find it in young children, you, f and you always get pretty much the same distribution of percentages. So 80% of people who receive the harm version of the vignette they think that the chairman did bring about the side effect intentionally. And the people who receive the help version of the vignette, so the people on this side of the, of the audience, they don't think that the chairman brought about the side effect on the environment intentionally. So this is sort of, you know, the original seed of the side effect effect. And the question is, why is that? Why do we find this puzzling pattern? And what makes this pattern so puzzling is that when we look at simply the details provided by the story, we see that as far as the mental states of the chairman go, as far as the intentions of the chairman go, the two vignettes seem to be exactly identical. In both cases, the chairman wants to make as much profit as he can, and he doesn't care at all about the environment. And it just seems to be the, that the value of the side effect is what's different between these two scenarios. But how could the value of the side effect have any relevance, the question is, for how much intentionality people should attribute to uh, the actions uh, undertaken by the chairman? That's the question. So the noble effect is there seems to be an asymmetry in people's attributions of intentionality and various other agential features, we'll go into that later, uh, an asymmetry in the attribution of intentionality 
that, that, that doesn't depend or that isn't driven by psychological categories. It's not actually driven by an actual difference in intentionality, but it seems to be driven by a moral difference. It seems to be dr driven simply uh, and purely by the difference in the evaluative status of the side effect. And that's the side effect effect. So the reason why this is puzzling, uh, why this is especially puzzling for philosophers, is that philosophers like to think uh, that there is uh, a very, very clear-cut distinction. Not, all of, not every philosopher th th thinks that, but many of them think that there is a clear-cut distinction between is and ought. So it's one thing to make factual judgments. It's one thing to you know, make, descri have descriptive beliefs about what is the case. And uh, theoretical reasoning is in the business of determining or trying to figure out what is the case, what the facts are. And it's another thing to, to, to try to figure out what's desirable or what's good or what's valuable or what's right or appropriate or what makes sense practically uh, or what's, uh, what's good or bad. So there are these two different types of judgments, factual judgments and normative or moral judgments, and two different types of reasoning, theoretical reasoning and practical reasoning. And the one is about stating the facts or figuring out what the facts are. And the other is about stating what ought to be done or what would be desirable and figuring out how one ought to act or personally or, or, um, or in general. And it's not just that, that there is a distinction between those two things. Philosophers actually tend to think that, there, that it's a mistake to confuse the two. So they're actually separate. Uh, and the, uh, this is sort of known as, the, the, as Hume's law, the naturalistic fallacy, that it's, it's typically considered fallacious to try to derive an ought from an is. So just because things tend to happen a certain way in nature, for example, doesn't mean that they ought to happen a certain way. And it goes the other way around as well. It's also a mistake to try to derive an is from an ought. Uh, so an example for the first thing would be, you know, it might turn out, and I'm not saying that it does, but it might turn out that, you know, two million years ago in the Pleistocene, the women would take care of the children. But from that, obviously, it doesn't follow that today it should be like that. Or nothing, nothing at all, normatively speaking, follows from that. So no odd follows from that is. And the other way around is, you know, it might be desirable if it turned out that climate change wasn't caused by humans, because then we could continue, you know, driving our SUVs. Uh, but just because it's desirable that that's the case doesn't mean that, it's, that it actually is the case. So, you know, you know uh, morality doesn't conform to, you know, uh, what, what's actually the case, and neither do the facts conform to what, what, what is desirable or what uh, morality requires. So there is this separation. And it's not just uh, a separation, but there also seems to be a particular temporal order between theoretical uh, judgments, theoret theoretical reasoning, and practical judgments and practical reasoning. So the idea is that typical, typically the moral judgments, they will be downstream from our assessment of the facts. So suppose that someone, you know, steps on my foot. In order to make a moral judgment, in order to blame that person for, um, for, this, for, the, for, the, for this incident or for this event, I first need to establish, was it intentional? So first I need to you know, have, a, have a proper assessment of the facts, and then downstream from that, I can make a moral judgment and say, well, you should apologize, or that wasn't really necessary, or you should have paid closer attention, or something like that. And that's, so what makes the noble effect so puzzling is that this sort of natural order of things seems to be reversed. And in some cases, the intentionality attributions seem to be downstream from the moral judgments. Because you see that the assessment of the evaluative status of the side effect drives whether or not people think that the side effect was brought about intentionally. So first there is a moral assessment, and that moral assessment then ends up determining the degree to which subjects are inclined to attribute intentionality to the, to the chairman. That's what makes it so puzzling. So the, temporal, so the typical temporal order between uh, descriptive factual uh, uh, judgments and uh, uh, normative moral judgments is reversed. Usually the moral judgments are downstream from the factual judgments, but in, in no effect cases that order um, is reversed, and the moral judgments are upstream, as it were, from, um, from the factual judgments. So that's what makes this uh, um, effect so puzzling. And now I want to briefly look into the question, um, what's the scope of the effect? Does the effect generalize to other concepts, or is it just restricted to uh, intention intentionality? Hint, it isn't. It does generalize to, uh, uh, to other concepts. Um, then I would like to address the question, what is it that explains this effect? Is it really about, the, about moral judgments triggering this asymmetry in uh, intentionality attribution, uh, attributions that we find? Hint, no. Um, and then in the end, um, I would like to briefly address the question, is this asymmetry, this pattern that we find in people's judgments, is that erroneous? Uh, is it a mistake? Is it a bias that people display in their judgmental behavior? Or is it a legitimate uh, aspect of our cognition when it's functioning properly? Uh, and I don't have an answer to that. 
not, not very satisfying, but so I keep changing my mind about that question. So when I first learned about the effect, I was sort of really, you know, firmly convinced that it was a mistake. But um, now I'm sort of constantly wavering. I'm sort of changing my mind every, 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 sec every six months. All right, so does the, does the effect generalize? And the answer is yes. So very, very simply, there is another version of this uh, effect that's uh, typically referred to as the epistemic side effect effect. And it's the same, st you give people the same story, you know, the chairman and the effect on the environment, and then you ask people, did the chairman know what the effect on the environment would be? So not did he intend to bring about the effect, but did he know what the effect would be? And you find exactly the same pattern, pattern in the harm version of the vignette. People say, yes, he did know. And in the help version of the vignette, people are sort of on average more likely to say, no, he didn't know. Uh, so you find the same asymmetry, but this time generated with a different psychological concept, so not intentionality, but knowledge. Um, and also, this asymmetry in attributions of the psychological category seems to be driven by not a, not a, not a genuine difference, it seems, in, in the actual psychological states of the described agents, but simply driven by the difference in the evaluative status of the side effect. That's the so-called epistemic side effect. And um, another really... Uh, um, well, emotionally gripping and graphic case is the so-called secretary case. And you find that, that's the second case that you find on your handout. Here, the concept at issue is free will and responsibility. And perhaps unsurprisingly by now, it turns out that free will and re responsibility are concepts that also seem to be attributed by people uh, um, differentially depending on the, either the, uh, the affective salience of the, of, the, of the described scenario or depending on the moral judgments that people make about that scenario. So this is quite a nice case. Um, so it's, first of all, you describe to people uh, a wholly deterministic universe. So you say, so you say, suppose there is this universe A, and in this universe, you know, there's only one possible thing that can happen. Everything that happens must happen, and is fixed by uh, sort of the, uh, the, the original starting conditions and the natural laws that apply to that universe. So just classic you know, uh, rendition of, um, of determinism. So imagine universe A, and in that uh, universe, everything is determined, and then you just, in the abstract, the one group of people gets the question, in that universe, in that kind of universe, can any person or agent uh, um, be responsible for his or her actions? And people say, nah. Uh, obviously not, because you know, everything's fixed. And in order to be responsible, uh, at least sort of according to common sense, in order to be responsible or to have free will, you must have um, al uh, alternative possibilities. But every, every, if everything is fixed in a universe uh, uh, on one uh, uh, on only one possible outcome, then you don't have alternative possibilities, so you cannot have free will uh, and or responsibility. But when you describe people exact, when you describe to people exactly the same universe, but you don't ask them in the in, in the abstract, could could some agent be responsible? But you describe to them in this case in universe A, a man named Bill has become attracted to his secretary, and he decides that the only way to be with her is to kill his wife and three. Children. Now, that's an extravagant choice of means, but let's accept the, sort of, you know, the outline of the, of the story. He knows that it's impossible to escape from his house in the event of a fire. Before, uh, before he leaves on a business trip, he sets up a device in his, in his basement that burns down the house and kills his family. Is Bill fully morally responsible for killing his wife and children, importantly, in this universe A, where everything's fixed? And people say, hell yeah. Just because... You know, it seems that sort of, it's just too emotionally gripping or it's just emotionally unbearable, it seems, to accept uh, that, you know, this uh, you know, a horrible, horrible human being could not be responsible, could be somehow excused uh, from, from responsibility for this action of killing his wife um, and his three children. So again, we have an asymmetrical attribution of some agential variable. This time it's not intentionality or knowledge, but free will and responsibility. Uh, so an asymmetrical attribution of that kind of concept depending on merely an affective or a moral difference between two um, scenarios. And another, uh, um, uh, a couple of other cases and a couple of other sort of psychological uh, um, or agential concepts which are affected by similar asymmetry. So the distinction between doing and allowing that has a lot of phil uh, philosophical re uh, relevance in normative ethics, for example, so how actively one does something or how passively one just merely allows something to happen, that's also affected by moral judgments. So this is the physician's story, the third vignette that you find uh, on your handout. There is this emergency room for physician, and one day, you know, a homeless man with, who is clearly no, no family, no, you know, loved ones, no, no, no ties to anyone. He's, he's being brought in, and he's going to die, we know that. He's de definitely not going to survive for longer than two weeks. And then the, so the physician asks himself the question, should I pull the plug on this patient, you know, letting him die immediately? And then there are two conditions. One is sort of morally ambiguous, and the other one is morally, uh, morally bad. And the morally ambiguous case 
is the physician is thinking when contemplating whether to unplug uh, um, the machine, you know, this poor man deserves to die with dignity. He shouldn't spend his last days hooked up to such a horrible machine, so the best thing to do would be to disconnect him from the machine. And in the other condition, the morally bad case, uh, he's thinking, this bum deserves to die. He shouldn't sit here soaking up my valuable time and resources. The best thing to do would be to disconnect him from the machine. And then you ask people, did the physician actively bring about the homeless man's death by pulling the plug? So remember, the action is the same. It's just about you know, pulling the plug. Or did he just allow him to die? Was it active or passive? And again, perhaps unsurprisingly by now, uh, in the morally bad case, people say it's active, pulling the plug. So he actively you know, killed him. And in the morally ambiguous case, we're sort of... You know, an action out of sympathy, maybe a little, a little bit perverted sympathy, but it seems to be sympathy, people are, um, are less inclined to say that he actively brought about the homeless man's uh, um, death. And finally, one concept uh, 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 that's also affected by, um, by the, uh, seemingly affected by the influence of moral judgments or moral considerations on seemingly non-moral judgments is the concept of causality. And there are two vignettes on, uh, on your handout. Uh, let's focus on the second one, that's the, the so-called driver vignette. Um, which has been around already since 1992, uh, um, I think, and has only recently sort of been discovered to, uh, to be a structurally analogous case to all the Nob effect, all the side effect effect cases. And here the idea is that uh, there is this driver, John, and he's speeding home and becomes involved in an accident. And the accident happens because there's another driver who's ignoring a stop sign and they, you know, run into each other. And then the question that you ask people is, um, who is the primary cause of the accident, or who's primarily causally responsible for, uh, for the fact that the accident uh, occurred? So, you know, remember the driver was speeding and the other, the other driver is ignoring a stop sign. And the question is, you know, uh, who's primarily causally responsible, not, not yet morally responsible, causally responsible for the fact that this accident occurred. And now the two conditions are, in one case, John, the original driver, is speeding home because he, because he wants to hide an anniversary present that he bought for his parents before they can see it. So it lies out in the open and he wants to hide it. And in the other condition, so the second group gets the same story, but the reason why John is speeding home is because he wants to hide a vial of cocaine that he doesn't want his parents to see. And predictably, um, people think that in the cocaine condition, John is more causally responsible for, uh, for bringing about the accident than in the sort of, you know, nice-ish uh, anniversary present um, condition. So even such, a, such, such an obviously, it seems, descriptive, factual matter, such as what caused what, even that kind of question seems to be influenced by uh, moral considerations, namely in this case, an assessment of sort of the character traits of, uh, of the driver, um, John. So that's just to give you an idea of um, the scope and the extent of the effect. It's not just restricted to the attribution of intentionality, but it works with, all other, with, with, with a plethora of other uh, um, types of concepts as well. Uh, you get similar asymmetries for free will and responsibility, for knowledge, for the means end distinction, for the doing allowing distinction, uh, and for um, uh, a causal influence. And many, there are many, many other. Um, uh, cases such as these. So the question is now, what explains uh, the, the, this, 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 this uh, set of asymmetries? Uh, what, what explains that we find uh, uh, this pattern? And the original uh, explanation that was proposed by uh, Joshua Nob himself was that, uh, well, we are moralizers through and through. And the idea was that there actually is, sort of, roughly speaking, there actually is no clear-cut distinction between figuring out what the facts are and figuring out what, what, what would be good and bad, or what's, mo what's morally right or morally wrong. All our cognition, figuring out what the, what's the case, you know, attributing psychological states to other agents, so basically uh, every kind of judgment we could possibly make is fundamentally suffused with moral considerations already. So there just, there just is no purely theoretical t uh, cognition. There, there just is no purely factual thinking. There, there just is no purely uh, factual figuring out what is the case versus figuring out what ought to happen or what ought to be the case or what would be good or what would be desirable. That distinction just, you know, collapses. And we are just... The, the influence of moral considerations on our cognition goes all the way down. So the whole distinction between theoretical judgments and theoretical reasoning and practical judgments and practical reasoning that philosophers hold so dearly uh, 
that whole distinction uh, uh, collapses because we see the influence of moral considerations on people's seemingly non-moral judgments to go very, very, very deep. It seems to be a very fundamental aspect of our cognition. Um, so this was Nob's original proposal, but then uh, people, including himself, people came along and showed that, well, it cannot really be uh, about the influence of moral considerations per se, and you see that it can't really be about moral considerations if you look at um, the next vignette, the so-called Nazi law case. It's sort of an Oskar Schindler style case. Uh, and here, it's, it, it's structurally, it's very, very similar to the original chairman vignette, but it has this Oskar Schindler twist, and I'm going to read it to you, and that you see sort of why uh, the pattern you observe when you give that story to people shows why it can't really be about, why, why the asymmetries that you find can't really be driven by, uh, by judgments of the moral badness of the side effect that's being brought about by the chairman, for example. So you have another chairman, just the setup is a little bit different. So in Nazi Germany, there was a law called the racial identification law. The purpose of the law was to help identify people of certain races so that they could be rounded up and sent to concentration camps. Shortly after this law was passed, the CEO of a small comp corporation decided to make certain organizational changes. Now, the vice president of the corporation said, by making those changes, you'll definitely be increasing our profits. But you'll also be, and here are the two conditions, violating, that's for one group, or fulfilling, that's for the other group, uh, the requirements of this racial um, identification law. And the CEO said, I don't care one bit about that. All I care about is making as much profit as I can. Let's make those organizational changes. As soon as the CEO gave this order, the corporation began making the organizational changes. And now the twist is that in the condition where uh, the chairman violates the requirements of the racial identification law, people's intentionality attributions go up. But clearly, violating this ra racial identification law is morally speaking a good thing. So the, uh, the sort of the, the increase in attributions of intentionality cannot be driven by the moral badness of the side effect, because in this case, the side effect that's being brought about, namely the violation of the law, is actually a good thing. So there seems to be something merely about, uh, sort of, the main thing seems to be about uh, uh, norm violations as such. So whenever there is a norm that's being transgressed, or whenever there's a rule that people are violating, or uh, some kind of obstacle that people overcome in order to, you know, uh, perform their action, that seems to be what's driving, what's driving the side effect effect, rather than just, and sort of the, uh, the, the badness-goodness distinction of the side effect is just one instance of uh, a possible norm that's being transgressed. So uh, it's really about, uh, um, uh, it's re what, what we witness in these cases is we see that normative cognition, more generally, rather than uh, a moral cognition uh, more particularly, is what's influencing people's attributions of intentionality, knowledge, yada, yada, yada. That's what we find. Um, so right now, um, I think um, the, the question how we should you know, accurately explain the, uh, the side effect effect, it's obviously not settled yet because it's to a large extent uh, a question that's uh, you know, hostage to empirical fortune and it sort of might be that there are more counterexamples that people will generate. But so right now, I think the best explanation of the NOB effect is the so-called salient norm account. Um, uh, because I think it captures the, uh, uh, the widest scope of cases uh, and it, um, it can also account for, uh, for the final vignette, um, which is the inheritance vignette. And there you have sort of uh, a really good piece of evidence. So this paper is from 2015, in fact. Uh, a very uh, sort of uh, suggestive piece of evidence uh, that it's normative cognition that, uh, that drives the side effect effect. So here you have more than two conditions. So you start with a story, everyone gets that same story, and then you, uh, you mix two conditions so you get four groups uh, in, in total. So the story is this. There's this guy called Carl, and Carl recently inherited $50,000. He's considering whether to invest the money in a Roth IRA, which is a type of a retirement savings account, or give it to Oxfam, a charity that helps alleviate the suffering of poor people around the world. And then what happens is you have groups of people who are asked to make judgments about that kind of case. And there are two different norms that you draw their attention to. There are two different norms that you make salient to them. And in the self-norm condition, um, the norm that you make salient to people is his friend, so there's this friend Diana, says, if you invest the money, you may be able to retire in comfort. And in the other condition, the uh, other norm condition, his friend Diana says, if you give the money to Oxfam, you'll help a lot of people. And then you combine those two conditions with two different outcome conditions. And you see that depending on the norm that you make salient, 
people tend to think that the outcome was brought about more or less intentionally. So when you highlight, well, if you invested in, in this uh, Roth IRA, you can retire comfortably, and then Carl transgresses this norm and ends up giving the money to Oxfam, then people tend to think, on average, that this action was uh, more intentional. And when you highlight the other norm, well, if you give it to Oxfam, you'll, ha you'll help a lot of people, and then Carl ends up uh, transgressing this norm um, and invests the money in his retirement fund, then people think that action is brought about more intentionally. And when you combine the, uh, uh, the, the norm conditions, uh, respectively, with the outcome conditions, respectively, then, uh, and they are in line with each other, so the norm that you make salient is uh, give it to Oxfam, and then Carl actually ends up donating to Oxfam. Then you see that intentionality attributions go down. So what seems to drive, that's sort of the final point, I think right now the best explanation of the side effect that we find is that it's about normative cognition, and in particular, uh, people's intentionality attributions are driven by um, cases in which there is a transgression of norms uh, or the overcoming of some obstacle uh, that people perceive to be salient. So people sort of feel, ah, it's that norm, you highlight that to them, and when that norm is transgressed, or when that obstacle is overcome, or when people act against that value, or against something that they're supposed to do, or against the reason that they might have, then people consider that uh, judgment, uh, or then people's intentionality attributions um, go up. So I think right now this is the best uh, explanation that we, um, that we find. Finally, perhaps, you know, the question where, where philosophically speaking the most action is, uh, is this pattern that we find uh, an error, or is it a legitimate aspect of our uh, moral cognition? Um, and so, some arguments that Nob sometimes uses for, the, for, for, for uh, when, when he tries to make the point that the pattern that we find, this asymmetry in the attribution of various, various concepts, knowledge, free will, intentionality, causality, and so forth, is that it's cross-culturally uh, cross stable. So we find it in people, in people from, 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 from Western uh, democracies, we find it in people from India, uh, and, and so forth and so forth. So it's very widespread and pervasive. And uh, it's a very, very early onset thing. So we, we find it in very, very young children. It just seems to me that these two, ty two types of things just have no bearing whatsoever on whether that uh, kind of pattern that we find is legitimate or not. And you can see that it doesn't because all the, uh, the sort of the biases that uh, Daniel Kahneman, for example, talks about, they're also very widespread. In fact, they're supposed to be hardwired to a certain extent. So you, you, you'd expect them to be not just widespread, but more or less universal. Uh, so whether or not something is universal and everyone has it, uh, has no bearing whatsoever, it seems to me, on whether the pattern that you find is, um, is legitimate or not. It's just sort of, most people could be wrong. That's sort of the basic point that I'm trying to make. Um, some empirical evidence that the asymmetry that you find might be an error, or might be considered an, 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 an error by the people who are subject to that asymmetry themselves, is that when you do a different style of experiment, so in a, in a within-subject design, and you give, you give both vignettes to the same group of people, or you give uh, the help version first and the harm version later, or the harm version first and the help version later. But you give the, the point is that, that people have access to, to, to more information because they get to see both versions of the story. Then the asymmetry tends to disappear. So when you give people both stories, they resolve this, this apparent inconsistency. They say, ah, oh, it's actually just this one difference in the evaluative status of the side effect. So I shouldn't, you know make different intentionality attributions in those cases. Or you get order effects, so when you give people the harm vignette first, and only afterwards you give them the help vignette, then people are subject to the same asymmetry, because they don't have that knowledge yet, so they don't, they don't, they don't know what the trick is yet. But when you give them the help vignette first, the help condition first, and afterwards you give them the harm condition, then people discount you know, this tendency they have to attribute more intentionality because they sort of say, ah, right, so it's, this is kind of similar, or identical, more or less, to the help version. It's just that this one says harm, but I don't really want to, you know, be subject to that asymmetry. And they cannot correct this mistake when they're given the harm version first. So this suggests when you give people more information, uh, they, the, the asymmetry goes down, or people sort of, people themselves don't think there should be this asymmetry. And this suggests, or it might be, might be a piece of empirical evidence suggesting that the Nob effect uh, is an error. Uh, another thing is that you know, people with a higher level uh, of general intelligence or people that are primed for abstract thinking, they tend to be uh, also subject to the effect, but the, the effect is less pronounced. So uh, you see that you know, when you give people more information by giving them both stories at the same time, or when people have improved reasoning abilities because they're more intelligent or they're primed for abstract thinking uh, um, and, and, and so forth, then 
uh, um, the effect goes down as well. So that's also another piece of uh, uh, another piece of empirical evidence uh, um, for the idea that the Nob effect uh, might be an error. And finally, this is something that I, uh, I like to refer to as the continuum argument. Is it seems to be that when you look at the whole scope uh, of cases, the attribution of intentionality, knowledge, means end distinction, doing allowing distinction, there seem to be clearly some instances of that effect which are erroneous. There seem to be clearly some instances of the effect where the, as the asymmetrical pattern that you find is illegitimate and people are making a mistake. And what I have in mind is judgments about causal influence. It, at least prima facie, it seems to be that whether or not something was the cause of something else is clearly not a normative or a moral question. So some instances of the, on, on this continuum of side effect style cases, some instances are clearly erroneous so the burden of proof is kind of on the people who try to make this legitimacy claim to specify the cutoff where these clearly erroneous instances of the effect turn into legitimate instances of the effect. And I think so far, uh, the people who defend this legitimacy claim, uh, they've, they've, uh, they've failed to supply this, this criterion for how to specify the cutoff between the clearly illegitimate instances and the, and the uh, potentially legitimate instances uh, like int intentionality. Um, of the noble effect. And finally, perhaps a more pragmatic point uh, about this legitimacy uh, um, issue has to do with uh, the costs that, might be, that we might have to bear if we accept the idea that the asymmetry we find is something that's legitimate and that's how our, our, our social cognition is functioning properly. That's a point that's, uh, that's been made by Thomas Nadelhofer and he sort of sa says, like, well, that ha actually has implications for legal context and for juror impartiality, for example. So when we think about cases of murder, or when, they, so when the allegation at issue is murder, then we have uh, um, an action, you know, the killing of a person, that's not just illegal, but also morally bad. But if, morally, if, if judgments of moral badness end up driving uh, attributions of intentionality, but on the other hand, whether or not something was intentional or not is relevant, legally speaking, for whether or not it was even murder in the first place, then we sort of get problems with, you know, the accuracy of judgments in legal cases. Because when it comes to was something murder or not, the temporal order between establishing the facts and you know, making a legal judgment uh, ends up mattering. First of all, you need to establish whether, whether, uh, whether a killing was intentional or not, and that then is part of the, uh, 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 becomes part of the information that's relevant for whether or not it was murder. But if, if, if sort of the, the allegation issue is murder, and that ends up driving the, int the, the, the intentionality attributions, then it might be psychologically more difficult for people to, uh, to, 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 to come up with impartial assessments of whether or not something was even murder uh, um, in the first place. And that might be a problem. And if we think that this pattern we find is legitimate, then that might be something that we have to accept. Well, we just, you know, there is that asymmetry. It's legitimate, so we, uh, we should expect it to be there and we should take, in, uh, take it into account. And if we don't think that it's legitimate, then we might, might wish to inform jury members uh, in advance about this bias that they are subject to. We might tell them, look, your attributions of intentionality will probably be driven to a certain extent by uh, how you perceive the case at issue, morally speaking. So be aware of that and discount uh, this influence if, um, if possible. So try to you know, counteract this illegitimate influence. So depending on whether or not we think this pattern, this asymmetrical pattern in people's judgments that we find is legitimate, that will end up driving all kinds of... Uh, um, um, things that are relevant for, um, for, for, for everyday life and for, uh, for legal context as well. So the lesson that we think I, uh, that we, uh, we should draw from this, I think, uh, is that when you look closely at what drives people's judgments, when you look closely at, what, at how people think about other people's minds, about the world, uh, it typically turns out that what influences um, people's judgments is far, far more messy and complicated and less introspectively accessible than we are inclined to think. So we'd like to think that we kind of sort of introspectively can figure out how we arrive at our judgments. But when we look closely, we find that that's not at all the case and it's very, very difficult for us to introspectively determine uh, how we think and how our cognition works. What ends up driving uh, our judgments is typically very, very complicated, far more complicated than we think. Um, and uh, often it turns out that um, our judgments are, are influenced by um, extraneous, irrelevant, illegitimate uh, uh, features of the, of the scenario. And when that happens, we are probably well advised to try to discount uh, this influence in order to arrive at, um, at better judgments and, and in, order to, in order to be sort of better able to figure out how we um, should live together. Thanks for your attention.
you very much for this fascinating talk. Uh, we have a few minutes left for questions. Um, and I have a question first, I think. Um, you said yeah, that you... You know, it's not supposed to go that way, right? No, but um, I just want to know. <laughs> no, no, no. You said you keep changing your mind on, yeah. um, on whether or not it's legitimate or not. But yes. your arguments all seem to point out that it's not legitimate. So why do you sometimes change your mind and think it is? Yes, yes. So I'm just sort of... Sort of as a, as a gut feeling, I'm sort of more attracted still to the idea that it's, there's something wrong with that. Uh, it's just sort of... Uh, if the, if the explanation that I tried to sketch, like the salient norm account, uh, if that explanation is correct, I think it, it's at least an open question uh, whether the attribution of this concept and the attribution of this concept and the attribution of this concept is or isn't legitimate. So it might be that it actually is more intentional to trans transgress a norm than to merely comply with a norm or something like that. Uh, and it might be that the answer whether or not it's legitimate is actually different in the, in the, in the where, where sort of causal influence is, um, is at stake. So that's what I mean. It's sort of, I'm, I'm, on a gut level, I'm, more, I'm still kind of, my suspicion is that it's illegitimate. Uh, but there is, I think, uh, lots of evidence suggesting that it might be sort of an open question and depends on the particular instance um, of, of, of the effect. So it might be legitimate for this concept, but illegitimate for, for this concept, for example. Um, I like your uh, <laughs> proposal, or how do you say? But uh, it is really shocking uh, what you tell uh, to us. Uh, I'm very sorry. I wonder, uh, <laughs> uh, I wonder where, where is the human rights in uh, the story? <laughs> yes, thank you. Could, you. could you explain that a little further? Mm, you mean, uh, uh, what, what is it about I this kind of story that, that sort of threatens human rights? Uh, well, I, I know Kant... Uh, uh, Started with uh, human rights, and there is. Uh, I understand you. You you talk about the context which is ours today, maybe. But uh, I don't know that the individual can uh, judge like you do <laughs> about uh, le legitimacy of not or not. Yeah, I guess. So, so I guess my answer would be. You know, what is the foundation, according to Kant, for uh, human rights and human dignity? Uh, and the foundation for that is, uh, you know, rational autonomy. Uh, that we sort of, we are able to, uh, uh, as rational agents, to determine what we, what we believe and what we do, uh, uh, not on the basis of, you know, external influences, but on the basis of good reasons. And so I think this, ki this type of research, and that sort of might, in, in, in the end, you might be able to connect that to the human rights question. This type of research, you know, gives us empirical information on what it is that ends up driving our beliefs and, uh, and our actions. And we can reflect, reflexively take that into account and improve our actions and improve our, uh, of our belief formation processes. So I think it doesn't, if, if you think that the foundation for human rights is something like autonomy, I don't think that this kind of research you know, undermines this picture of autonomy and rational agency. It just gives you a further tool and useful empirical information you know, for boosting your rat rational agency. And it might be, you know, unpleasant to find out that lots of our beliefs and judgments and actions are, 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 de are determined by unexpected and unwanted um, extraneous influences. But, you know, tough luck. I mean, that's just the way it is. And we need to take that into account and, uh, and try to, 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 uh, to use that information um, um, to, to, to improve our agency and our, and our belief formation processes. I think that's, that's, the, that, that, that's the, 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 the response that I would be inclined to, uh, to give to that. It's, uh, it's about humanity. Yes. It always is, isn't it? Can I make a comment? You speak, yes, please. Uh, you spoke several times of moral, moral, moral sense when you first about like the viewpoint. Sorry? The but why all, all the time moral, moral, moral sense? Philosophers can take a scientific point of view. You can take any other point of view, legal point of view, because philosophers are supposed to be trained in holistic science, not just a particular social science background or natural science background. Then philosophy itself would be biased subjective. So a philosopher, if he takes into account scientific basis of a judgment, it will be a different judgment than the just taking the moral basis So why this um, the patient should be treated or not treated. If, if scientifically, if he has to die in two, two weeks, then why we should allow him, him to suffer another two weeks? So, and also the, 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 the waste money. So, if you would have lived longer time, yeah. okay, you could have spent money and energy on, on that. So, so do you think it's just a scientific fact that you know, cost-benefit analysis tells us that we should, we should unplug the I machine? I think we should look into uh, the, not only the, the moral, moral, moral sense, also other aspects. 
the scientific and other other aspects. Logic and reason should they comprise all other aspects also, because otherwise it would be just the the one-sided. Right. Uh, we just become more religious oriented, just looking at the things <coughs> from the moral sense point of view. Right. So I fully agree with you, uh, but I just want to you know uh, uh, draw your attention to to. to um, to the different subject matter, I think. So it's, 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 it's a very, very valid first-order question. What should we do in those kinds of cases? Should we unplug the machine or provide further care? Uh, but this is more a second-order meta-ethical question. It's not about what should we do in that case. It's about what is it that drives people's judgments about those cases. Uh, so it's not really, you know, normative ethics. This is right, this is wrong, here are some reasons pro, here are some, some reasons con. It's, 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 it's a meta-ethical, uh, uh, it's an experimental approach to a meta-ethical question, which is uh, how do people think about those questions, rather than what is the answer to those questions. But otherwise, I'm, 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 I'm in absolute agreement with you that uh, you know, philosophers, and this is a perfect example for this, uh, philosophers and, and the general public as well, should always take into account the relevant um, empirical uh, um, evidence and the latest science on something. But I think this so-called experimental philosophy approach to certain philosophical questions is, 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 is a very good example for exactly that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're out of time. Uh, so I will see you in a few weeks in May. And thank you very much, Hanno Sauer. Thanks for coming.